Wife of the President, Aisha Buhari, says the population of out-of-school children in the North is disheartening. Mrs. Buhari, who said this during the inauguration of a pet project, Future Assured Youth Education and Empowerment Program, aimed at training 750 young persons in Adamawa State, said the situation required the government's urgent attention. She said the case is most disheartening in the northern states where insurgency, poverty and social cultural norms have played key roles in further worsening what is left of the ruins of dilapidated structures, insufficient and poorly motivated teachers at all levels. According to her, education deprivation in northern Nigeria is driven by factors such as economic barriers and social cultural norms and practices that discourage attendance in formal education, especially for girls. Joining me in the studio is Omikunle Folau. Way. She is the CEO Teach Nigeria. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And still with us is the MD Sterling Bank, Abubakar Suleiman. Pleasure to have your company still. All right, I will get you right in. The wife of the president is reacting. She's reiterating actually a concern she has expressed over time. And uh, she's saying that there are lots of effects. Um, that poverty has on education. I want to ask you your specific experience as regards the matter of education in the North. Um, so it's interesting that we're still talking about this, just the same way we're talking about this in 2013. Specifically, the First Lady is expressing her concern about the out-of-school children in Nigeria. And we, we first, not that we didn't know that there were out of school children in Nigeria before 2013, but I think 2013 was when we got the actual numbers and it was said that 10.5 million children are out, out of school. And if we look at seven years since then, you have a child who was 10 years old who is now 17. And we're still only just talking about it and we haven't done things differently to change that. So I work in, in Northern Nigeria. And with my experience of seeing how the out of school ch um, children is, 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 has layers of issues that has sort of grown that number. And I'll take, for example, a particular school that used to accommodate about 3,500 students. Now, this particular state introduced a school feeding program just so that they could get more kids you know who are out of school into school and the population went from 3,500 to 29,000 now they had another issue to deal with so kids were showing up in school ready to learn but there were not enough teachers there wasn't enough infrastructure to accommodate accommodate the kids to teach them so they were dealing with an you know a population explosion in that case another case that I've experienced she did mention about girls is that you know, the likelihood of a girl not attending school if she comes from a poor background is higher, is higher than a boy. And so you go into communities where the parents would rather have the girl stay at home doing chores or going to the market with them and hawking. You also have a situation where in northern Nigeria, if, you know, it's, if, if it happens that there is no um, toilet, if the toilet is unisex, um, the girl child is most likely not able to attend school. If you have a situation where there are not enough female teachers and you only have male teachers in the classroom, there's a high possibility that that girl would not be allowed to go to school. Also, you have social cultural issues where this girl, you know, is seen to get married on time. So as early as 10, 13, 12, you know, they're sent off to get married. So my issue is beyond just the fact that, yes, we know that kids are not going to school. We have other layered issues that is driving and growing this number as well. So if we don't you know, I, you know, I can get into like solutions now, but we need to think about this a bit more holistically to say. We'll, we'll come to the holistic part of it in a bit, but let's bring uh, Suleiman into the conversation and talk about the aspect of the girl-child education. Um, I do hear, I don't know, you can confirm that young girls can be home and their parents will refuse that they go to school due to some cultural um, issues. Is there a way, in your opinion, that we can you know, get these girls back to school without necessarily um, destroying their foundational belief in culture, religion. How can that be integrated, so to speak? Well, um, I'm a Muslim. I'm from the North. My daughters are in school, and they will go to school as long as I can afford to. Point is, if you're educated and you have a gainful employment, you have the income, whether you are from the North or the South, you send your kids to school. Right. Let's never forget that. The reason 
Above all else, these kids are out of school. Either their parents are either not educated or they don't, they don't end the income. Well, there are some that have said it has to, sometimes it has to do with the cultural belief that girls, even till now, up not, that girls um, should not, you know, be too educated, so to speak. Mm. That is a reality. So how can that mentality be tweaked in such a way that it does not completely offend what makes the essence of the people, that's their cultural belief, mm -hmm. and at the same time ensure that these girls get the kind of education they need to grow? Okay, for emphasis, I'm going to repeat it again. I have not met any educated northerner who has a good income whose daughters are not in school. Uh, from the Emir's daughter who, uh, Emir of Kano's daughter who are doing their master's and foreign degree, or the governors. So, root cause, it is not the cultural issues that keep girls out of school. It is when you mix it with extreme poverty. And no matter what you say about the culture, if the extreme poverty is not resolved, these kids are not going to go to school. Um, just to add to that, the challenge more often than not is not just the fact that these kids don't want to go to school, it's that they become labor at a very early age. You need them in the farms, you need them in the market, you need them to be able to keep the family alive. So I would like to talk about cultural issues, and I wish that those were the problems because it's easy to propagate against that. And there are some of that, but the material issue we're dealing with is that of just extreme, just pure extreme poverty. So when you get 87% poverty in the north, you're going to get 87% of the out-of-school kids in the north. So do you share this position and to your earlier position on holistic evolution of the whole thing? So, How do we go about it? So I, I, I agree with him. And also just to add to what he said is, I remember engaging with, um, with a mother in a community in, in northern Nigeria. And, you know, she said to me, why should I bother sending my girl to school when I've sent one of my daughters to school and I've seen no value? She hasn't been able to be employed. She is not able to do anything with the education. And I sold in this market and invested that in getting this girl to school. So what's the point? And so another thing that I'm seeing quite often is the fact that people are not seeing the value for the education. So you go 12 years through school, you go through this entire education system, and then you come out and you cannot be gainfully employed. And so, you know, that's one of the issues that I've seen. And another one is we don't have enough role models who are advocating for this grassroots and locally. So sorry to interrupt you, but when you talk about not the value in education, does it have to do with the kind of education that is provided? Because education so, in itself yes. is said to bring lights and Absolutely. education should not necessarily, you know, translate to so direct... I'll, give, I'll give you a simple example, right? We have kids who are living primary six, and even as far as Genesis one, who are not able to read and write a simple sentence, and this is no joke, right? So you have that child going through the school, being pushed through the system, and then you finish, you know, by SS three, and there's an expectation of value that you should have received, you know, going through those years of education, and there's still nothing to show for it. Now that's the value that we're talking of. So your child comes out, and even a, a basic text message that comes from one of the telcos, that child can't even read it. Now, there's no encouragement and motivation for that parent to still invest their money, even if it's free education. They're not going to bother buying the uniforms, the textbooks required to support the teaching just because they don't see that value at the end. You, you, you're doing a sort of educational outreach, mm -hmm. your brand of mm -hmm. um, you know, trying to get education to as many people as possible. How is it different? You know, and Basically, what do you do different that you think should be replicated across the board to help the situation? So, a lot of times people argue with us saying, why are you getting people from diverse academic backgrounds to go into teaching for two years, which is what our program does, and then you know, after two years they leave the classrooms? Now, the reality is the challenge that we're facing and the challenge we're addressing is a systemic and interrelated challenge, as we all know. And so the idea we've seen Teach for Nigeria is modeled after Teach for America, Teach First UK, Teach for Bangladesh teach for India and we've seen the examples of what happens with the alumni who go through that program and the things they get on to influencing the ecosystem. I'm going to take for example just as we're speaking on this matter teach for Afghanistan and in Afghanistan they have very similar issues with what we're experiencing in northern Nigeria but we have girls who have gone through the program they've taught for two years and they've realized that you know sometimes the mothers just want to see a role model of what 
someone who a female educated you know person could look like and the example of what they can get onto so they've started a movement post their two years of teaching in Afghanistan where they're now you know talking directly to parents encouraging them to send their girls to school you know and they're showing that you know what your daughter can also be like me and can go on to university and become an engineer yeah, I would love to take you more on that but I'm told we have a little time left I want to have to ask this question the corporate world in this country are they doing enough if not what more can they do to help the government because we really cannot leave the education of our future just in the hands of government um, i agree with you i think the mistake we make is to think of government as the only way to solve problem in our society it is not it is just i guess the formal way there are other ways uh, I think that the, the way to make corporate effective in solving problems for education or for poverty is to create a sustainable way where they can deliver. What they do well is to bring in resources and create value that is, that is more. Uh, if you expect them to do it via um, you know, charity, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. It's just not going to be enough resources. We need to create a framework that means that I can provide education and make a profit. That is the only way it has worked when you bring in the private sector. Okay, I have to ask this. So, what impact has contributed efforts from NGO? Um, we have the uh, Not an Education Initiative uh, uh, Plus, I think, is from the US um, Aid. Aid. Yeah. Movements like that, how can there be a collaboration to help? I think that those are people who enable you to explore new ways of doing things. They're bringing the kind of resources you need to experiment and figure something out but they're not going to be the one to provide resources in perpetuity. So once they've experimented and demonstrated a workable solution, both the government and the private sector should then jump on it and scale it. Your final thoughts, please. So, you know, totally agree with him. I think we're only going to achieve sustainable development and educating the entire nation through collaboration. We have to work together, whether it's business sector, whether it's the government, whether it's NGOs, social entrepreneurs and innovators. We need to, you know, stay together and work together. That's the only way we're going to get to where we're going to. Thank you very much for your time in the news. Thank, Thank you. you.